determining motivation and qualifying. And I'll go over this when we actually start the presentation, but it's really geared for the investor. So the investor who finds the off-market deal, how they actually qualify a prospect and then ultimately make an offer. Um, you might ask why we are tra training people to do this by owner. Uh, the owner and founder, Rob Chavez of Grid, really believes in what he calls coopetition, which is really just sharing all the information and ideas, and then it comes back. And of course, if anybody needs real estate pros, that's what Eric and I are here for. All right, I'm going to actually start this. One second. All right. Cool. All right, guys. So today's topic is how to negotiate the deal. Just a quick introduction. Um, as many of you know, my name is Matt Green. I am an agent with Cobalt Banker here in Philadelphia. And this group is for wholesalers, rehabbers, investor agents, lenders, vendors to connect and learn and to share and to share deals. Uh, to go into partnership with each other. There's lots of good things that come out of these meetings. And um, I'm thankful that you all are here. I want to introduce um, our guest tonight, Eric Koffer, a good friend of mine, fantastic agent. I wanted Eric to join this meeting because a lot of Eric's business comes from people that he does not know. And when you're working with people that you don't know, especially the ability to qualify those clients and prospects for motivation uh, is critical because obviously you don't want to waste your time or their time working with somebody who uh, is not qualified or motivated. Uh, before we start, I just want to thank Spring Garden Lending Group. They are a private lender here in Philadelphia that do construction loans, um, all sorts of private financing. If anybody wants to get in touch with them. They're one of our sponsors. My assistant will send out the information after the meeting as well as Keystone Title Services. Really appreciate you guys sponsoring these meetings. Um, just a quick legal disclaimer. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that's discussed tonight, these are our opinions only. Consult a real estate attorney or legal expert if you have any questions. All right, so what is a motivated seller? Well, obviously, uh, a motivated seller is someone who's compelled by circumstance or emotion. Um, we're going to get into the difference between those two things because there is really a, a difference in how you can approach a, a, a seller who's motivated by circumstance versus one who's motivated by emotion. A distressed seller is someone who might sell a property for less than the market would support, less than the market value, under normal circumstances in order to achieve a quick sale. And obviously for a seller to be motiv motivated, there must be something going on in their lives to motivate them. So the two biggest motivators are circumstance and emotion. <clears throat> An example of circumstance could be the property condition, right? An abandoned property, something that needs to be work, uh, something that needs work something that sustained fire damage, water damage, mold damage. Uh, these could all be examples of circumstantial motivated sellers. Uh, financial, right? The seller can't afford repairs. The seller is behind on their mortgage. The seller has already moved out of the house and is carrying now two mortgages. That is obviously a motivated seller, as well as convenience. Um, we see this a lot here in Philadelphia. Somebody lived in a property, moved to California, is now trying to manage that rental across the country. They no longer have a need for the rental property. Um, that is a seller motivated by circumstance. Seller motivated by emotion is one who's become emotionally detached because of a couple things. Number one, condition, right? The, the property's falling apart. They don't have any money or time to make repairs. Shame somebody who is unwilling to have others find out about their financial hardship, right? Somebody who's behind on their mortgage, somebody whose property is in poor condition, 
Um, they may want to sell the property privately off market and just get it off their hands. Emotional distress, divorce or estate properties and bad rentals. I actually have a listing right now that was um, rented out as an Airbnb. The uh, tenant never paid any rent for about 16 months. The seller now obviously wants to get rid of that property. Here's what's interesting, you guys. A seller motivated by circumstance, right? Something financial needs the house to be sold, but mostly they're motivated by the financial piece of it. The seller motivated by emotion could just want the house out of their life altogether. Eric, I wanna ask you, you know, I'm sure you run into both situations uh, with estate properties. Tell us a little bit about your experience in working with sellers motivated by circumstance and those motivated by emotion. Yeah, um, yeah, estate executors, there's, there's usually a high level of emotion um, circumstances also. People leave properties in all sorts of situations when they pass on without a will, without just having the place cleaned up, reverse mortgages, um, all sorts of all sorts of things. Uh, and you have to ask the questions to get to the bottom to see what really the situation is. Do you ever run across people that just want to get rid of the property where price is not the most important thing? I run across people that say that, um, <laughs> you know, until, until the time comes to price the property. And um, I saw a question from Sean, you know, is that a for sale? The fastest way to find out if something is uh, is not a fire sale is if someone says, I don't have to sell this house. This is not a fire sale. Well, then they're probably in a situation where they where they do have to get it sold sooner than later. Um, so you just really have to drill in and get all the information and don't necessarily just trust and believe what they say. When the emotion aspect is in there, particularly when shame is involved, They'll hide things from even you when you're supposed to be representing them. So getting a title search up front, um, you know, really doing your research, you can save yourself a lot of trouble in the end. Yeah, so and, and what's, what I think is interesting about these two things, speaking to the investors now, I mean, if you're an investor and you're thinking about making an offer um, you know, privately to a seller, all right, so a seller motivated by circumstance, somebody who is behind on their mortgage, somebody who's carrying two mortgages, you know, in that sort of a financial situation is typically going to be more motivated by the dollar amount. Somebody motivated by emotion, right? It's been a horrible rental property. I want to get this out of my life is going to be more motivated and more enticed by an offer that's clean, click contingency free. So it's really, really important distinction to pay attention to a seller's motivation to determine what sort of an offer they may best respond to. Any questions on that, guys? Anything to add? All right. So when you are calling these people, when you're talking to them, obviously be friendly, but businesslike. Um, you know, a lot of people teach in real estate that you want to build rapport <laughs> in these situations, um, keep it down to business. You know, that's my, my only, uh, my only thought. Would you agree with that, Eric? I agree with that. Um, yes, you, you've got to keep it to business and you're not looking to make friends at the same time, you have to approach them and not have, um, you know, money breath yep. because they can sense that. Uh, you have to show them that you're working to accomplish their goal and in the process, accomplish your own, uh, not necessarily just take them, you know, over the coals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, getting into a lot of small talk, um, you know, if it's an estate property, of course, being empathetic to the situation, uh, be careful if the, the conversation veers into things that are not real estate related for too long. Um, that can lead you down a path that's tough to recover from. Okay, number two, determine motivation. We're gonna be talking a lot about that tonight. Um, this is really the meat and potatoes of the conversation. So let's dive into it, let's take a deep dive. Um, I believe personally 
that the three pillars of motivation are where, when, and why. Where, when, why. Okay? So the first one, where. I want to ask you guys, I'll ask you, Eric, why is where the first question we typically ask? Why does that make sense? Uh, they'll, they'll give you a lot more information than just what's involved in that question. It'll usually unfold like an onion. Um, you know, where will result in them telling you all about their financial situation um, and really what they're looking for. It'll also give you an indication of timing, an indication of whether they're in a situation where they've got payments backing up, um, if there's you know, some, some reason that they have a certain time frame in mind. Uh, so it's kind of a loaded question. Well, no, so, you know, it's not, but I think that there's some, some intention here and some strategy, right? When somebody says, I'm going to be selling my house, I feel like a natural question is, where are you moving to, right? I mean, it's like, that's a natural first question to ask. The intention and the strategy, as Eric said, and I totally agree, if you really listen to their answer, you can tell a lot about their motivation. Eric, have you ever asked somebody, where are you moving to? And they say, I don't know. All the time. And what does that tell you about their level of motivation? Not necessarily very high. Yeah, um, right? It, it may indicate that they are in a distressed situation. They don't know where they're going, but they have to get rid of this. So it leads you to, to your next questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, you know, for me, when I hear, I don't know, my first thought is, well, what happens if the house sells today? I mean, are you going to be living out of the car? <laughs> you know? um, but you're exactly right. That could mean somebody has no idea what they're going to do, or it could mean somebody is just fishing for a value from you, right? And so part of this qualifying process is to really make, you, you know, the amount of time you're spending in any sort of conversation or with any sort of potential client is to make it more efficient, right? We don't want to be going and meeting with people who actually don't have a need to sell. Second question, when? You know, how soon? Oh, and let me say this, you know, not to state the obvious, guys, if you know they're not living in the house, don't ask where they're moving to. You're going to sound like a complete idiot. Okay. <laughs> Second you can question. Ask what they intend to do with the proceeds when they sell their house. Yes, exactly. Um, second question, how soon, how quickly, soon and quickly, you know, you could ask, when do you want to have the house sold? But part of sales is creating urgency. So using words like soon and quickly, you know, Sean, how quickly do you want to have your house sold creates a sense of urgency. It also gets them to answer the when part of it. Again, if you really, really listen to the answer, you are going to get a lot of information about the motivation. If somebody says they have to sell it right away, that should be a light bulb going off. If somebody says 12 months from now, not so much. Right, Eric, do you agree? Absolutely. Okay, third question. And probably the most important question, why? All right, now I want somebody other than Eric to tell me why we don't want to ask a seller why they're selling, right? Why don't you want to phrase it like that? I'm going to start calling on people. I think it sounds a little bit confrontational. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So asking somebody why they're selling tends to put them on the defensive. And that's really the last thing we want to do when we are attempting to, you know, to, to extract, to get important information about really why they're selling. So some ways that you can ask that question without asking why are, tell me more about your decision to, help me understand more about what's important to you about. Is there anything specific prompting you to What's most important to you about, right? Those are our five, one, two, three, five ways that you can um, get to the why of a seller's motivation. Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Any other questions that you ask that uh, suss out, you know, why a seller might be selling the property? 
Those, those are good questions. Um, yeah, I, I normally ask people what the sale will accomplish for them. What are they looking to accomplish by, by selling the property? Um, and you can get to the bottom of it. Okay. I, I had a question in the chat that I always find interesting on um, when you are pre-qualifying a seller. And I'm just curious how you guys would handle it. You yes. know, if you're in a, in, in, a, in a listing appointment and you can tell they're not being honest right in some of their answers or it's or they're you know not making eye contact or it seems um either just disingenuous do you walk away or do you still try to move forward and list it eric it depends um i've had situations where i've asked people if they if they trust me um and just by asking the question, usually they'll they'll go one direction or the other. They'll either open up or they'll they'll just they'll say no. And if they say no, then really what they are fishing for is to just use you for your opinion, and they're not really looking to involve you in their problem solution. Um, so you just have to lean in, really, and. Um, and get to the bottom of their their uh, apprehension. Yeah, so I, I've had this happen at listing appointments and I think uh, a scripting strategy that um, is successful is to lead in with I'm noticing, right? And just be authentic. Trisha, I'm noticing from your body language that we're not really connecting right now. Help me understand what's going on. Did I say something that's thrown you or how are you feeling? And, you know, I've had people, you know, lean back, cross their arms, and just by stating what I am noticing, um, they've been able to open up and say, you know what, I didn't like what you said about the price earlier, or, you know, I disagree with X, Y, Z, and then you can really handle what's going on. You know, I remember hearing from uh, a class that someone named Matt Green taught, a Coldwell Banker, uh, a while ago, pre-pandemic, that older people like to be touched. You know, there, there's a, uh, I don't know, there's a warm, uh, you know, I, I guess they, they feel a little bit more comforting, like when you touch them, you know, gently or something like that. Uh, I'm curious as to how that plays in when you're handling with someone who is apprehensive during pandemic times. Well, I wouldn't be touching anybody. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> no, my... <laughs> My brother said that to me. He said, you know, S, amiable personalities like to be touched. I thought it was so strange. And then I was at a listing appointment and I just kind of placed my hand very near this woman's hand and like she totally responded to it. So I, I think there could be something there. Obviously right now, people don't want to be touched. People don't want to be breathed on. You know, some people may not even want to meet with me. So I don't think I'd be doing that uh, uh, now. All right, so after the when, uh, the where, when, and why, right? So you know where they're moving to. You have a time frame within which they want to move. You have an idea of what's causing them to want to move, right? If you've got those three things down, and of course the trick to this, because you know in your mind you're making a determination of the, the person's level of motivation to determine if you even want to go on. If they are a motivated seller, or if you're an investor, if they're a motivated person that you feel like you may want to move forward with in terms of making an offer, um, then we get to a value-related question. Do you have a value in mind? Um, Eric, why do you think it's dangerous to approach either a listing appointment or even if you're making uh, an individual a private offer without having any idea of what the value is that they have in their mind? Well, you can just be completely wasting your time. Um, you know, if somebody if somebody's value in their mind is a million dollars for something that's worth five hundred thousand, you got to ask yourself if you even if it's even worth going out there. And if you do, and you don't have an idea, then that initial reaction of yours and theirs is occurring face to face at the table, rather than with a, a couple of hours or a couple of days of buffer time. Um, you know, if, if somebody's thinking uh, 300 and you send them information suggesting that it might be 250, you'd rather than get that 
reaction out of the way before you're sitting there. Um, yeah, and obviously, listen. If you are if you're an investor, and this is uh, this is investor driven, so we can look at this from an agent, or we can look at this from you know the mindset of an investor. Obviously, guys. I mean, I think it's common sense that if you are going to uh, make an offer for somebody's property, and the offer that you have in mind is substantially different than what they have in mind, that that could set up a very awkward dynamic or confrontational or whatever, you know, whatever ad adverbs you want to attach to that, it could not be pleasant, right? So you want to, uh, and you, it, and just to back up, you may not even want to make an offer to begin with, depending on what the value somebody has in their mind is. So you can ask if somebody has a value that, you know, they have a value for the property in mind. Many times they say, no, I don't, or what do you have in mind? Or they're very, you know, they deflect the question back to you. Um, so there's some strategies that you can use to kind of expunge the value to kind of get an idea of what it is that they're saying. Um, one of those strategies is to use the tax assessed value. Now, remember, we all know that the tax assessment's usually incorrect, but the purpose of, of these strategies is to just get some sort of a baseline with the seller. So for example, you know, Sean, I see that Philadelphia County has your house assessed at 377. You know, is that, does that number seem high to you or low to you or kind of right in the ballpark, right? So that's one way you could use the Zestimate. We all know that the Zestimates are often incorrect, but again, this is just a way to get them talking so that you can make a determination for yourself of where they are in terms of their numbers. Or of course, you can use recent sales in the neighborhood if you're familiar with the location. Hey, you know what, Mr. Mr. Seller or Mr. Homeowner, I know that properties like yours are selling in this range to this range. Is that kind of in line with what your expectations are? Eric, is there any of the things that you do to try to get a value when somebody's not disclosing to you what they're thinking? That's it, really. Uh... I use the tax assess value, I use this estimate, and I just ask them if it's in, in the ballpark of what they have in their mind, um, or asking them if there are any liens against the house, and um, you know if that factors into their opinion of their value. Great. Does so, anybody have, I have any a, strategies? I have a guys? question. I, have a, I guess I have a question more than a strategy, or am I talking too much? Am I okay? Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, what do you do in circumstances? And I appreciate the group pre-qualifying. I know that you walk in with comps, but we're also in a market right now that we're seeing prices that don't come at, comp out, right? Where, you know, investors and or, you know, and, and buyers, right? And sellers. So I know, Eric, you and I have talked offline on this where you pre-qualify, you'll walk into a presentation and your number say is 300 and they're like, well, I went 340 because of how crazy the market is. You know, do, do we stand, stick to your guns and say, well, it's not worth it because you don't want to overprice the listing or in the marketplace as it stands, do we continue to take it and hope that our sign's not sitting? Well, it as an agent, it's one thing. As an investor, as an investor it's it's another. Um, so that that's kind of a personal decision on the on this case and the buyer's uh, level of risk that they want to take, whether they want to buy something for more than it comps out in hopes that by the time they have it ready to go, it's going to be uh, making up that difference. So then obviously, Tricia, this question can relate back to the motivation. Um, you know, if, if this is a, an investor having a conversation with a distressed seller, they may be less inclined to bring that sort of a thing up. If you're a listing agent going into a listing appointment, um, listen, if there is a one week supply of inventory and the most recent sales support 300 and they're thinking 325, I'll deal with that when I'm going to get there. I mean, I'm not really, really concerned about that. Make sense? I'm assuming it does, okay. Um, is the mortgage current and how much is owed? You know, this is super important, especially if you're an investor thinking about making an offer on a property, you certainly wanna make sure that uh, the person you're getting into contract with can satisfy 
uh, whatever liens are against the property. And then the next question, are there any known liens or judgments? And then describing the condition of the property. Any questions on determining motivation, clarifying questions, anything to add? Does Keystone, um, are they willing to do title searches for people before they are committed to buying something? Yes. Okay, because that's valuable. I, I've been facing a lot of this lately with estates where it's not till the third or fourth conversation with someone that they finally open up about the reverse mortgage, which goes higher and higher as time goes on. Um, you know, and, and I've had two situations where I really wish I would have had a title search done before I even wasted the time on the conversations to that point. Um, yeah, they so that's will. Good to know. You know, I mean, it, they'll be obviously more inclined to do it for you if you're able to compel the buyer's agent to then use their title uh, yeah. company and use their title search, which a lot of times they will do. Okay, so now we get down to making the offer. All right, so there's some strategy involved in this. Um, this goes into last month's topic. Some of you may not know this formula. I didn't know this before coming a grid, becoming a grid leader. So it's a really quick and easy way to formulate an offer, especially if you're flipping a property. All right, so you wanna be in front of your computer, right? If you're not, just tell them you'll call them back when you are in front of the computer. And the formula, let me get out my phone here, is 70% of the after renovation value minus the renovation cost. I wanna dive into this, what does this mean? All right, so if I'm at a property and I'm looking to flip the property and as an agent or an investor or consumer, I know that the after repair value or after renovation value is $500,000. Okay, I'm gonna take 500 times 70%, that's 350, that 30% is subtracting out your profit, your carry and your closing costs, all right? That brings me to 350. If the property is 1,500 square feet, um, we talked on last week's call that for a flip in Philadelphia, for example, the average cost per square foot to renovate is about 75 to 100 for like a full gut could be closer to 120 to 140. So I'm gonna take 1500 times 100, uh, times 100, <clears throat> that's 150,000. 350 minus 150 is $200,000. So that would be my quick offer in my mind of that 1500 square foot house that I wanna flip knowing I can make a profit of about 20%. All right, now the strategy here is if you throw that number out to them and you can even get close, right? If a person says to you, hmm, I might be able to work with that or, you know, think about it, that it's in the ballpark, make an appointment to see the property. All right, if you don't like the house or the price or the person, right? You may not like any of the three of them, ask if you can refer them to somebody who might be in a better position to help, whether that's an agent, attorney, or another investor. Then you set the appointment. Okay, so at the appointment, when you're walking through the property, make sure all parties are available to sign. This can be tricky, as Eric can attest to, if it's an estate situation, there are other administrators or executors, they may not all be there. Eric, how do you handle that? If you're setting an appointment with an executor and there are multiple people involved, do you insist that they be there? Do you do it on you know, a, a conference call or do you just have one point person and have them deal with the other signatories. Before you go, you ask them if there are any other decision makers involved in the process. Um, otherwise you'll get there, you'll go through the whole process, you'll ask for the signature and suddenly they have to check with whoever, wherever, which is often a deflection. So if you can um, eliminate that before you go in, that's great. What if um, I've done before? presentations just like this over Zoom with people in other states. Um, yeah. So you, you just have to handle it. If there are three executors, you may, um, you may try to Zoom the other two. Yeah. Are there any circumstances where you just meet with one or do you try to avoid that? I prefer to just meet with one and have the other ones um, sort of give their, give their proxy to one person 
um, the more people you have in the in the room, the the longer it takes, and the the more likely it is for someone to disagree. But if it has to be, you can do it on Zoom. Sure. Cool. Um, check the status. Personal representative, power of attorney. Do they have the appropriate paperwork? You know, remember, guys. Part of this is being efficient with your time. You know, not getting into a situation where somebody may not be able or have the authority to sign or have the necessary paperwork. Um, so it's a good question to ask. All right, so you're now at the property and you're walking through the property. If you're an agent with the seller, if you're an investor with the owner, you know, a good place to start in terms of conversation is requalifying them using the previous questions, right? We want to avoid small talk. This is a business transaction. So, you know, I'm walking through, you know, Mr. Seller, I remember you saying that you're moving down to, you know, Orlando, Florida. Ideally, you'd like to be there by April 1st because of X, Y, Z. Um, you know, it's a good place to start the conversation and keep it on track. Ask directly about any deficiencies. This is super important. If you're gonna be buying a place and you notice something is the matter, something doesn't look right to you, point it out, ask them for more information. And then make an offer based on what's important to the seller, right? So this is, you know, again, important to investors, also important to agents. Right now, we're, many of you know, we're seeing multiple offers on many properties. So it doesn't always come down to the price. I'm always asking to the other agent, what other than price is most important to the client, right? And how can we make this offer stand out? Probably removing contingencies. You know, giving a large deposit, giving a non-refundable deposit, waiving an appraisal contingency, waiving inspection contingencies, doing inspections, you know, with repairs up to a certain amount of money. There's all certain ways, there's all sorts of ways that you can be creative. Also, if it's an estate property, a distress situation, offering to clean out the property, to purchase it with all of the belongings. Um, one thing that I've been doing um, for clients that are purchasing rental properties is asking a permission to place a lockbox and then um, doing a, a, a rental open house while the property is in escrow so that it can be delivered fully rented. Um, Eric, what else are you doing in this environment or how could an investor who's, you know, making an offer to an individual seller kind of enhance or sweeten their offer, you know, aside from escalating the dollar amount? Uh, those are all good things. Um, you know, emptying contents and, and all of that. One thing I've been seeing a lot on the agent side with competing offers is where buyers are offering to cover the transfer tax for the entire transaction, which increases the net to the seller but doesn't raise the amount that the property has to appraise for financing. Um, you know, and that in Philadelphia, I mean, that adds an extra 3% to the, to the transaction. Um, I don't know that that's, you know, helpful to an investor. They're not necessarily worried about an appraisal price for financing, but you know, there are lots of tips and tricks. It's all situational. Well, and be call a very good agent like Matt Green, who has the experience to know what to do in each of those situations. That's right. I have to remind all the investors on here, if this is too, you know, varsity level for you, call a pro. Uh, me and Eric, Sean, and all the great agents on here are always happy to help. Um, shoot, I just had a thought in mind and I'm trying to think about what it was. Sean, you've been writing a lot of competing offers. What has made your offers stand out and what advice would you give to an investor who wants to make an offer to buy something? I would say, you know, I've been working a lot with first time home buyers versus investors, but I would, uh, given this market, just in general, what stands out to make an offer strong, given the inventory is so low, would be to know, know, know the comps, know what has been selling uh, so you can come in at a decent price. Uh, I find that an escalation clause, if you know there are other offers out there, you have to do an escalation clause. Uh, the other component would be shorten the contingency period. Um, I've also had inspections as FYI, or 
there is a an amount set that the buyer, you know, or investor will pay X amount towards any deficiencies in the home. Uh, and the other component would be, uh, I've heard of pre-settlement walkthroughs as well, you know, just so you get a good basis of what the major items of the house uh, entail before you're ready to uh, offer, you know, over asking price or, or put a certain amount that the buyer is willing to pay for uh, any repairs. Yeah, and, and I remember I was gonna say, um, so, you know, a lot, I'm not seeing this as much in this market, but I know it's happening in a lot in the suburban markets where people are looking to buy another house when they sell theirs, right? That presents a whole challenge where there's no inventory. Uh, I'm talking to a lot of other agents who are, you know, either extending the settlement date way out or doing a post-settlement possession addendum where the seller is staying in the house for up to six months after the close. You know, I'm hearing from a lot of people that buyers just want the house now and they'll be willing to work if they can with the timing. So those are awesome strategies to help you make your offer more competitive. Last thought, uh, a truly motivated seller will try to sell you on the house. You can always use some negative selling such as this sounds like a fantastic property. Help me understand more about how I can assist you with this, right? If somebody is um, trying to oversell you on something, that's a, a telltale sign of motivation. So using the takeaway clothes can be an effective way of sussing out what's really going on in their minds. Who has questions? I actually typed in the question earlier. So when, uh, just to backtrack a little bit. So when the seller is trying to gauge, you know, through Zestimates and, and everything else out there, what to price their home, what if they point blank say, what, what, do, you, what do you think? Uh, would you pr name a price for them? Wait, say the question again. So if a seller, because uh, you were mentioning that get an idea from the seller as to what they think their home is valued at through the city estimates, through his estimates, things like that. So what if they point blank ask you, okay, what, what, what do you think my house is worth? Would you give them an answer or would you uh, let them give an answer first? Eric? I, I do not give them a direct answer. Um, Why? It's, because you're always going to, it's, it's never going to be what they're looking for. Uh, they're either going to think that you're, that you're overestimating because you're trying to get their business or that you're giving them some terrible low number. Um, the most I'll do is reference what other things are selling for in the neighborhood and ask them if you can come look at the house to give them a specific number. I would never insult someone by giving them a number without actually seeing their home. Um, and if you present it to them that way, then they'll understand and they'll appreciate that you don't give them a number over the phone. Yeah, so what Sean, I think that the answer to the question lies in the intention of your conversation. Is it possible for you to get a contract signed over the phone? I mean, I suppose you could press DocuSign. Right? Sometimes. No, no, no. So, you know, you, the whole purpose of these conversations, whether you're an investor wanting to buy something or an agent wanting to list a property or, you know, show a buyer a listing is to set the appointment with the seller and then asking you, you know, point blank, what do you think the property's worth? They are swinging that front door open and inviting you to come in. Sean, I'm so glad you asked me that question. When can I come see your property? And I can answer that directly for you. So you would right. give them a price after you've seen the property in person? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's part of a listing presentation discussing price. But okay. if someone's asking you, what, what is my house worth? That is like the golden ticket to just setting an appointment, right? Because that gives you the perfect opportunity to say, you know what, let me come take a look and I can give you a, a much tighter range. Okay. Make sense? It does. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, Melissa Anderson. All these people on mute. All right. Um, so thank you guys for joining tonight. Uh, my assistant will be sending out an email to everybody 
who is on tonight's call with contact information for our special guest, the fabulous Eric Hoffer, as well as the sponsors. Um, please join us for the next meeting. It's the third Friday of every month. And I look forward to seeing you guys in 30 days. Have a great evening. All right. Thank Bye. you, man. Thank you, Eric.